So we continue with our project where we're learning or going through anatomy, but having movement as our central point of meaning or the central point in our network of meaning or semantic network. Here we're looking at shoulder external rotation. Similar thing as far as the planes in which shoulder external rotation can happen in. And that's primarily because the glenohumeral joint is multiplanar and multiaxial, but we'll get to that when we talk about planes. So shoulder external rotation, more or less as a giveaway, can occur in multiple planes, right? But it's the same, it's the same general movement, but it can happen in different planes because the glenohumeral joint is multiplanar and multiaxial. So our main objectives, uh, specific discussion of what shoulder external rotation is, which I already kind of alluded to, but we'll do it more particularly with respect to planes and axes, general discussion of the muscles that externally rotate the shoulder, very general discussion of the nerves that supply the muscles that externally rotate the shoulder, very general discussion of the vascular supply, and general discussion of areas to assess and treat should shoulder external rotation issues be suspected or reported. And as a light giveaway, these areas are going to be the same with almost any dysfunction of the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder girdle, generally speaking, it's not going to change because of how the neurovascular bundle rolls and moves or proceeds through the body in an organized fashion, maybe a better way to say that. As far as planes are concerned, so we're looking at shoulder, no, we're not looking at shoulder abduction, that's a typo, please excuse that, but it's shoulder external rotation, so we go through the planes first, the sagittal plane is a 50% cut of the body left to right. The horizontal or transverse plane is a 50% cut of the body top to bottom. And the frontal or coronal plane, 50% cut of the body back to front. With respect to shoulder external rotation, from the anatomical position or from that neutral position where the arms are at the side and the palms are up or supinated, external rotation, if I bend the elbow, you'll see it. So this is kind of the neutral spot. External rotation is also called lateral rotation. So it's rotation away from the middle line of the body. So in the anatomical position, that would occur in the horizontal or transverse plane. Now the axis is kind of funny because the glenohumeral joint, you've got the little kind of the little cup or the little ball in the glenoid fossa and the big, or sorry, the big little cup and the big ball in the head of the humerus. So it ends up being multiplanar, multiaxial. It's more so the muscles that determine the the axis now they'll generate similar motions almost no matter where the shoulder is but you're you're going to have some mix-ups there depending on where the actual shoulder is so in a anatomically in the anatomical position external or lateral rotation occurs in the transverse plane about a relative vertical axis however as we noted here, we can make it happen. So this is internal rotation in the coronal plane, and then we can have external rotation in the coronal plane. This is quite limited. It doesn't go particularly far, but that's external rotation in the coronal plane. You can have internal rotation in the sagittal plane and external rotation in the sagittal plane. So anywhere you go in between those three cardinal or common planes, you can have internal and external rotation. Internal rotation is going to be towards the middle of the body, relatively speaking, and external rotation is going to be away from the middle of the body, so lateral. So we call internal rotation generally medial rotation, and because medial rotation gives you the sense that things go to the middle of the body, lateral rotation gives you the sense that they go away from the middle of the body, but it doesn't matter. So I can put it here, right? I can put it in some weird co configuration. Let's look at the internal rotation and the external rotation, regardless of where it is in the planes but you can have internal and external rotation but here we're specifically more so speaking about external rotation in all three of the cardinal planes about their relative common axes the axes of rotation regardless of the plane is perpendicular to the plane itself so in the sagittal plane you have a horizontal or transverse axis in the vertical plane sorry rather the horizontal or transverse plane it's a bit vertical axis and in the frontal plane it's an ap or pa axis so those would all apply to external rotation regardless of which plane you're in but the that external rotation motion can happen in all three of those planes and if you want to be true to the plane then you'll call that axis however because of the nature of the of the glenohumeral joint itself it almost doesn't matter where it is with respect to the cardinal planes because it will do external rotation or external rotation will occur as far as the muscles we have a general schematic of the of the shoulder girdle more or less here or the upper upper body or the upper portion of or the thoracic region however you want to term this you can call an image like this whatever you want but as far as 
external rotation, you're going to have the posterior fibers of the deltoid, the infraspinatus, and the teres minor. So you don't have a large amount of muscles generating this motion. But the, they are part of, or at least the infraspinatus and the teres minor are part of the rotator cuff group. The rotator cuff group, so you have supraspinatus, uh, sorry, please excuse me, subscapularis, infraspinatus, yeah, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. I'm messing something up here. Anyways, they usually call them the sit. Yeah, it's the sit, subscap, infraspinatus, teres minor. Yeah, anyways, that said, uh, aside from my minor gaffe on camera, the rotator cuff as a group, so it's tough to pick apart, but if you look at subscapularis on the upper portion, on, the, uh, on that side of the upper portion of the image, you'll see that generally it goes lateral. It generally goes almost straight out in the coronal plane towards the humerus. You'll also note that relatively speaking, the teres minor, the infraspinatus also do the same thing. Right, so they they curve. So you're going to look on the bottom image, and you're going to look over there. But they go somewhat in the coronal plane towards the humerus itself. So in continuity, the rotator cuff as a group is going to pull the humerus towards the midline of the body. Each muscle is going to have its own. It's another layer of function as far as the movement it'll create more or less on its own. But as a unit, the rotator cuff keeps the humerus pulled into the body or in towards the midline, when movement is called for, you'll get some difference. But generally speaking, you can see that from this image and that has some value, which is why you end up looking around the borders of the scapula whenever you have a shoulder girdle dysfunction, as well as why you look at the pectoral tissues, right? Because the pectoralis major also has the ability to pull the humerus towards the midline which is, again, these, these muscles, so the rotator cuff in and of itself, as along with the pectoralis major, are going to pull the humerus towards the middle angle of the body, generally speaking, especially in the anatomical position. And then that lends to why, at least partially, as far as the muscles are concerned, you're still going to check around all of the borders of the shoulder, regardless of the dysfunction that you're identifying. As far as the neurovascular bundle, you're thinking about the same things with anything with the shoulder and pretty much anything with the upper limb. You're thinking about the cervical region. You're thinking about the clavicle. Uh, you're thinking about the upper ribs, especially. You will think about the ribs generally, depending on the particular thing that you need to consider. But the you're going to think about the humerus itself and the borders of the scapula. But as far as the neurovascular bundle in particular, you're thinking about the cervical column, the anterior and middle scalenes with respect to the artery, right? So the subclavian artery, as well as the brachial plexus passing between the anterior and middle scalene, <clears throat> as far as the vein and the lymphatics are concerned, you're actually going to think about the SCM and the anterior scalene, because that's going to pass. So the lymphatics are going to dump into the subclavian vein in the region of the clavicle, as well from between the clavicle and the SCM and the anterior scalene. So kind of right in here is where you're going to have some lymphatic drainage on for essentially the entire body or the terminal point right about here. So you then have to think about the clavicle and you have to think about the upper ribs. As far as the rest of the neurovascular bundle, you're thinking more or less about the axilla because you're thinking about the axillary artery and the brachial plexus as it follows the axillary artery and then sends branches out. And then you're going to think about the axillary vein as well. So we don't necessarily need to name the specific nerves, but you're thinking more or less the uh, suprascapular nerve, the axillary nerve, and I believe that's really all your the specific nerves, but the pathway, if you think about the general pathway in and around the shoulder, so you check the pectoral tissues, you check the clavicle itself, you check the neck, you check the upper ribs, you check the borders of the scapula, you, and every once in a while you're gonna have to check the bicep, biceps brachii, you've probably gotten most of what you, the information you would need to see if there's a disruption to the neurovascular bundle with respect to external rotation or really any other shoulder girdle issue, the same areas are going to apply. And then you're going to be specific to the motion problem at hand, because if you're specific to the motion problem or motion problems at hand, regardless of which motion you're considering, you're going to more accurately behave with respect to what you found, as opposed to 
chasing down a specific branch of a nerve, which you're not going to find, or a specific br branch of an artery, which you're not going to find. You're going to find motions because you're working from the outside of the body. So just to reiterate the areas of consideration, the clavicle, so neurovascular bundle, the cervical column generally, so neurovascular bundle again, uh, be it at the bottom between the SCM and the anterior scalene for the vein and the lymphatics, be it for the art between anterior and middle scalene for the artery and the, the nerves, be it the clavicle itself just for general dysfunction, be it the clavicle in relation to pectoral tissues, be it the pectoral tissue, so that you're going to go from the clavicle then to the cervical column, generally speaking, instead of me rambling on in a non-specific way, the thoracic column, generally speaking, you're thinking about more so with the thoracic column, tissues that would span from the thoracic column to the cervical column and dysfunctions that they may relate to. You're going to think about the relationship between the thoracic vertebrae and the scapula itself, and then you're going to be considering ribs there as well, so ribs are part of the list. You're going to consider all borders of the scapula, so the medial border, the lateral border, and then more or less you call the pectoral tissues the anterior border, although the pectoral tissues or pectoral muscles are noted there. You can organize medial border as rhomboids and traps, the lateral border as the rotator cuff-ish muscles and the lat and then the pectoral tissues or the anterior border is the pectoral tissues. So in that sense, you've essentially gone around the entire thing, found any motion dysfunction you can found, find, be it uh, a gross motion dysfunction or uh, poor yield to pressure in the muscles. So the muscles, as you attempt to put pressure through them, they don't yield. So some areas do yield and then another area doesn't yield. You found some form of motion dysfunction there. The reason you do that, again, is the neurovascular bundle and then the relationship between all of these areas and a specific motion dysfunction, in this case, external rotation. But when you're dealing with a shoulder, you just check all of that and you treat what you find and then your treat your assessment will be specific and your treatment will be specific to your assessment. You'll behave, you'll behave more accurately to what you found in a situation like that. Now, as far as contraindications and red flags, known fractures or tears, you don't treat them. Suspected fractures or tears, you send them out for more medical examination. Depending on where you are, you'll have to choose a different practitioner. Recent or maybe even an emergency room, depends. Recent or dramatic changes in cognitive functions. Uh, this relates to the head and neck. You don't have to pick apart what might be happening. You just have to know if there's a recent dramatic change in cognitive function. You don't treat that, you send that out for medical examination. Recent dramatic changes in respiration, could be heart, could be lung, doesn't really matter. If somebody's having a hard time breathing and it's recent and dramatic, you don't treat, you send out for more medical examination. And the reason that we talk about this with respect to shoulder external rotation in particular, or any of these, is because of the areas of consideration for assessment and treatment. So make sure that you're not treating things that are dangerous to you or to the patient. You send out things that you're unsure of or that could be medically dangerous.